The more things change, the more they stay the same. In today's episode, we're going to talk about why it's so hard for human beings and societies to change their routines. It's your introduction to religious studies, and it's coming up right now. As we work our way through this introduction to the study of religion, you've probably realized that human beings are creatures of habit. They, they do things with stunning regularity. They're rather predictable. And the reason why this is the case is because we tend not to be able to see any alternative than those things that are before us. For example, have you heard of this discourse called meritocracy? Craig Martin uses this example of meritocracy to unpack or deconstruct um, a lot of the ways that society works, especially around change. I'm going to use it, but toward different ends, um, just for a minute. Meritocracy is a discourse in which social quality and gain are essentially products of work. I'm going to say that again. Meritocracy is a discourse in which social quality and gain are essentially a product of one's work. Meritocracy is one of those discourses that is just very hard to get out of, very hard to change, very hard to alter for many people, even though we see alternatives to it all the time. Like on the one hand, we love to be inspired by the story of someone who's been able to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. On the other hand, most of the examples of people we see who are successes are the products of their environment. They're the products of the work of people before them. They are not self-made, but they are socially contingent. And certainly there's a lot of creativity and invention and innovation that goes into that. That's part of what we study in the study of religion and culture. But human beings don't live in a vacuum. They are creatures who are part of the effect of prior causes. They are creatures who are part of the effect of prior causes, meaning that there is no self-made person or individual. We are social creatures and creatures of habit at that. This is why also in the study of religion and the history of religions in particular, we understand that the idea of conversion is actually really rare. People tend not to change their religious identification. And when they do change it, they might vacillate for a little bit. They might change it to certain levels of degree. But by and large, people stick with the ways they came up identifying, what they were taught. This is why the chief predictor of one's religious affiliation for my money is your zip code. You tell me your zip code and I will likely be able to Frame for you how you identify, religiously, politically, you name it. Zip code says a lot. Now, I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not going to actually bet you that I can determine how you identify strictly by your zip code. But this is, this is why so often when we make small talk, one of the first questions we say is, where are you from? Because where are you from supposedly gives us so much information about how you view the world. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how you view the world and why it doesn't change very much. Craig Martin introduces to us this phrase, the matrix of perception, as a way of thinking about how people understand the world around them and perceive the world as something that just is what it is. Now, a lot of this has to do with structure, and you're going to see a lot of parallels in this video with the video from structure about structure. But this video is going to focus on the world as viewed by individuals in light of the structures around them. When we talk about the matrix of perception, we are talking about the way in which we human beings build the world, but also how that world seems to then build us back. The matrix of perception is all about the way that we move through the world and build the world around us, but that that same world seems to build us back. And as a result of that dialectical process, where we build the world and it seems to build us back, the world seems to just be how it is. It's essentially just what it is and how we view it. Similarly, on a more personal note, 
We have these dispositions. We are just the way we are. We like what we like. We do what we do. And dispositions are the way, the states of our being. And Craig Martin outlines four dispositions that seem to be part of that way that we perceive the world. These dispositions are preference or taste, our ability to discern or distinguish between like subtle differences, right? There are areas of knowledge, domains of understanding in which we apply a great amount of nuance and we're able to sort of tease out subtle differences. We also have these ideas of success or life goals that are part of our dispositions, that this is what it means to be successful, to have made it, to arrive. And lastly, our common or practical sense. Preference or tastes, ability to distinguish subtle differences, ideas of success and life goals, and our practical sense are just four dispositions that are ways of framing our world and the world around us that we've built as normal, the way it is. As we think about the difficulty that comes with bringing about change, Craig Martin introduces to us a key sociologist who helps us think about this very idea. His name is Pierre Bourdieu. Pierre Bourdieu is going to be very uh, important for our work because of his introduction of this term called habitus. And habitus is very much like the terms that you're probably already thinking of when I bring about this word, right? Maybe habit, like something that you do when you um, aren't even thinking about it, right? It's just a habit, and it's hard to kick a habit, right? Um, habitat, the world in which you live, right? What's your natural habitat? Um, maybe even a habit, like a nun might wear, um, a, a garment that covers you from head to toe that is a sign of your commitment. All of these connotations are worthwhile for thinking about what Pierre Bourdieu is getting at when he talks about habitus. And for his definition, I'm going to turn you to page 88 in Martin's um, second edition of A Critical Introduction to the Study of Religion. Um, because there, in our book, he says the following, and I'm going to read it. This is toward the bottom, in italics. Habitus is that part of oneself where one's matrix of perception lies and where one's dispositions or predispositions sit, and all of this is the result of a process of socialization that varies by one's society and class. A habitus is that part of oneself where one's matrix of perception lies, and where one's dispositions or predispositions sit, and all of this is the result of a process of socialization that varies by one's society and class. This is a key definition for us that really gets to the very idea of why our view of the world does not change without a tremendous amount of work. Habitus can be a tricky idea to wrap your mind around. After all, it's talking about something that we don't even have to talk about because it's just the world as it is. But Bourdieu is trying to challenge us to step outside of ourselves, step outside of our social boundaries into that outside position where the normal or the familiar starts to look strange. And when he does that, he says that we're going to begin to notice that our view of the world is in part a result of structured structures. And by this, he means I think something akin to what we talked about with structures um, and Peter Berger, objectivization. That notion that the world is objectively, outside of ourselves, just this way. And Bourdieu is saying, what are the mechanisms and processes in society that make the world appear that way? So there are structured structures. Habitus also includes another sort of notion next to about structure that Bourdieu calls structuring structures. And I would liken this to 
What Berger talks about is both externalization and internalization. So this is the way that human beings interact with each other, reinforcing their understanding of the world around them. Right? So there's social interaction that's going on between people. Right? You have the ideas that you and the, the beliefs and and um, discourses that you hold dear, right? The things that you think you must express because it's how you view the world. But you also interact and exchange with other people and bring those into yourself. So you, ex you have this internal notion that is to yourself that you hold and, and, and possess. But then also other people have those and you exchange those and that reifies the structure around you. Internalization, externalization. As a result, though, of course, we know that the world begins to just take on a shape of its own, at least from our perception, from our matrix of perception. And that objectivization are the structured structures. So think about how you come into being. I mean, children here are the best case study. Children are born knowing nothing. But from the get-go, they begin to start downloading as much information as possible. They look around, right, and they, you know, at, at best, they perceive a difference between um, less light um, and more light, less heat and more heat. Um, they, they know by instinct that they have to eat or they're going to start to hurt. They know there is stuff that they have to get out or it's going to hurt them, right? So pain is a, a mechanism here. And from that, it just gets more complicated as they start to make sense of the world from the inside out. But then also there's all this stuff going on around them too. People drawing their attention to different things, people telling them what to do, people showing them things, people holding them and stimulating them and um, responding to them. That outside of themselves, it seems to be a world that's taking shape. And it's the interaction between those two things that begins to construct the world around them. They start putting pieces together. Now, all of these pieces are random from their initial conception. But as they spend time in this social interaction, they begin to bring about structures to the point that we get something called object permanence. The notion that an object that is right over there is going to be there whether I turn my head or not. This is a learned skill. This is why peekaboo is so fun, right? Because you get to see, oh yeah, it's there, it's not there, it's there, it's not there. And then as a kid, as you grow older, it becomes less fun because you realize the person you're playing with is still there just moving their hands like this. Structured structures, object permanence, objectivization. The world just becomes fixed and stays that way. And as we begin to make our social interactions fit with those structured structures, we begin to create a box in which those social processes, as dynamic as they are, are fixed within the rules of the structured structures. This is why we say it's such a remarkable thing when people think outside of the box, because the box is the world. It is the universe as we perceive it. And to think outside of that takes a tremendous amount of effort. Inside our box is our habitus. Inside the box is our habitus. Getting out of here is extremely difficult. It is hard to do. Hard to change. All of this is a result, and that effect is called the hysteresis effect. The hysteresis effect. The hysteresis effect is the result of the structured structures and the structuring structures that make it difficult to change. The hysteresis effect 
is the result of all those social processes that we've been talking about and that we will continue to talk about in this class. So I think it's important for us to think about how habitus works and the hysteresis effect and everything else related to it at both the social and individual level. So to do this, I'm going to bring us back to some terms that we learned about um, in the previous video. Um, and I'm gonna put those on this left side here. And then I'm gonna put new terms related to it um, on the right side. So recall last time that we talked about naturalization the way that our social constructions can appear to be natural, the way the world is. At the individual level, we might call this normalization, right? That we have norms and ideas that we stand by, the way our dispositions become um, de rigueur. They become the way the world is, and we would expect nothing but that. You'll recall that we also talked about um, domination. When one group's uh, naturalization uh, is used and has the effect of um, putting down someone else's naturalization. In other words, that one person's naturalization has deleterious or negative effects for another group. When we talk about this at the, at the individual level, we're talking about something called discrimination. And here, discrimination is not just like, oh, you use the bad word that's bad for other people. Oh, you're judgy, you're prejudiced. It, it certainly means that. But it also means the way that we make decisions, right? One who has discriminating taste is one who can tell subtly why one thing is good or one thing's of lesser quality, right? right? You have a, a refined palette that helps you um, note that there are levels to the thing that you're experiencing. That's what discrimination is. And there's a social effect that comes with this when you're able to say that something that is normal to you um, is the way it is and that what someone else says is normal for them um, is less than. That's discrimination. Um, and so we wanna look at how those, the social effects of such discrimination or such um, normalization in practice works. Uh, lastly, and related to that very point, where we had group bias when talking about social structures. When we talk about habitus, we're talking about privilege. Now, I know this is a heated word in our public discourse. Um, privilege, right? White privilege um, is, an, is a term that gets used a lot. When we're talking about privilege here, what we are talking about is related, um, but I want to put it in terms of what we discussed thus far that if your view of what is normal is the ideal type, the basis on which you discriminate everything else within the box that is our habitus, your habitus, and that's the social world around you, if you are able to say that your discrimination of what is normal versus not normal defines and constructs the box of our social structures, that is privilege. Yeah. Human beings have a vested interest in making sure that the worlds that they build with their words and with each other are built to last. Those worlds are not to crumble easily. And as scholars of religion and culture, our job is to be able to step outside of the box, to take a look at the habitus in which these people do what they do, in order to make sense of why they see the world to be so seamless, even though it's the product of their own projections and creations built according to their own dispositions. The matrix of their perception defines the world that they see around them, but also the worlds which they wish to build. And they never build those worlds in a vacuum. We as scholars of religion are tasked with understanding the history of these creations, of these constructions and why the discriminating tastes that are behind them draw lines of difference between people who are just like them trying to make sense of the world around them.